Our story begins with an ambulance was taken off at this hospital and four doctors immediately rushed inside together with Young's body, which was full of bruises and blood. As what they observed, see Young's condition is getting worse. His hands fell to the side as he was losing consciousness. There were policemen who came with the ambulance where Si Young was carried. They sighed as they felt sad about what happened to the kid. When they entered their police car, their radio rang and someone informed them. There are eyewitnesses reported eight suspects, all wearing school uniforms. It was a total of six boys and two girls. And upon checking their uniforms, it was confirmed that those students are from Enguang Middle School. And this is the school where Roman 11 Young was enrolled. Both policemen were shocked that the bloody mess was done by just middle schoolers. They cannot believe it since they saw Young was nearly dead. And because of this, they then decided to catch those students. Other than that, the man in a white suit asked if they will deal with the press and the man in black squeezed his eyes and casually answered yes, they then go to catch the culprits themselves. In the present day, Si Young found himself floating in the air, and he heard a voice of a lady calling his name. When he opened his eyes, he saw his aunt who looked worried for him. The lady held his hand and asked if he was already awake. Si Young didn't respond, but he knows in his mind that it was his aunt. There was already a bandage on his eyes since the doctor put it. After he cried furiously at this time, he still wondered where he is. All of a sudden, he saw the culprits mocking him while he was lying in bed. His sweat dropped from his forehead as he was terrified. He was catching his breath, and his aunt was worried for him and continuously calling his name. Si Young was struggling to death as he was traumatized by what happened to him. The doctor and a nurse then entered the room as fast as they could, and the doctor of Young injected him with a sedative to calm him down. Si Young finally simmers down, and this had happened to him several times. His eye was still open a little, and he saw his aunt discussing with the doctor. He witnessed how worried his aunt to him, and the doctor informed the lady that he administered a sedative to Si Young. So he concludes that Si Young is okay now. His aunt was still worried that he will not wake up again anymore. Don't worry, it'll be okay for now. Didn't I already tell you he should be waking up soon? The doctor answered okay. He's been in a coma for nine months, I've just been worried. Si Young's aunt responded. Upon hearing it, Si Young realized that he was lying in bed for the past nine months without waking up. When he woke up after, the doctor injected him with a sedative. And this lady is his aunt. According to the lady, she thought Si Young would never get out of the coma. But now she was relieved that after nine long months, Si Young finally woke up. Since then, she was praying that Si Young will never give up. While she was talking, Si Young was still not completely on his senses. His aunt mentioned that she could never forgive those who murdered Si Young's father and mother. At this point, she already expecting Si Young to be mad at her. She was trembling in anger while saying that she sued those people. She did everything she could, and even if they dealt with the detectives and prosecutor, she believes that Si Young's father will stay dead. Upon hearing her statement, Si Young started crying. His aunt wiped out his tears and said that she wanted those murderers to be punished. She could accept the results and believes that Si Young's mom would have agreed with her. But they managed to reach a deal with the eight people who did this to Si Young. At this point, Si Young can't still utter any words. According to his aunt, those students who make Young suffer were all suspended. The homeroom teacher and the superintendent were also temporarily dismissed. But still, it wasn't enough for them. Si Young's father and mother were both very kind. And for his aunt, the punishment those kids were given would never be enough. She was shaking in anger and felt down as she recalled the incident. She did everything to get justice. She made flyers she posted on the web and she tried to petition. She used all of her contacts and tried her best to let the people know but she couldn't have known. Even after what she did, the news and articles could still not be made. The police were even powerless, and prosecutors overlooked it. She said that those who wanted to help were all chased away and eventually got in trouble. It was then she learned the power of having an influential family. The police, inspectors and reporters were all playing in the palm of those people, 
and she concludes that Seung will never get back what he lost, and the suspension of those delinquents has already passed. He then asked his crying aunt about what had happened to his parents. Although his aunt was struggling, she poured out and talked. She started crying while thinking about how Roman Eleven Young's parents felt. Roman Eleven Young's mother and father were both burned alive in front of Guangwoman. After they were both poured with gasoline burned and had their bodies charred, and his aunt could do nothing. She was powerless in front of it, especially since the fire was too large. Roman Eleven Young was dumbfounded upon hearing it. His eyes continuously fall and he was hoping that this was just a dream. He cried loudly while catching his breath and the only thing he heard is his aunt calling his name. He was hoping that he was just sleeping and everything was not true. Because of thinking so many things, he becomes terrified and screamed as loud as he could. His aunt let him watch his burning father since there are some people recording on their smartphones. When the incident happened, his mom embraced his burning father and two months had passed since the funeral of his two most important people. While he was just sleeping, his aunt said that those criminals got punished and went to juvie school. His aunt smiled while saying that those police, prosecutors, and the media all wanted to punish them. Aside from that, the lady stated that these students were all investigated and even the public was scared. At first, it was six months of juvenile school, but there was pressure from the internet and media, so it was moved up to two years, the lady uttered, and she also let Si Young know that the superintendent, school principal, and the supervisor of Young were all dismissed. Eventually, the parents of those culprits also held a joint conference to improve public opinion. But the public didn't sink so easily. When the video of his parents spread, the people witnessed the gruesome scene, and the video got a total of 7 million views and counting. While Si Young is in a coma, even the president came to visit him, and the whole country was excited. Si Young is just an ordinary plane who has nothing and couldn't do anything for his parents. For him, it was compensation for taking their own lives. Two years after, the landlord of where Si Young stayed talked to an old lady below the building. The old lady is a new renter and is willing to contact the owner once she faced any problems with her stay in this apartment. Upon hearing this, the landlord's mood instantly changes. He said that the lady should not reach out to the owner, and he claimed that he is the one in charge of acting on behalf of the building owner until the end of the contract period, since this is the relation to housing. The old lady was still insisting as she wanted to say hello to the owner and the landlord told her that the owner hates meeting people. The lady was confused upon hearing this and the landlord instructed him one thing as a precaution. He said that the owner of the room she rented is using the rooftop room and the rooftop room is highly prohibited, which means she cannot enter or exit from the stairs on the fifth floor leading to the roof. She will not be able to go up because it is locked with an auxiliary iron gate. Do you have any inconveniences? If so, you can cancel the contract now. The man uttered and the lady was terrified by his serious look, so she didn't say anything at all before leaving. The landlord smiled widely at her and was glad that the lady understood what he said. He hopes that only good things will happen from now on. They both then bid goodbye to each other after their discussions on the rooftop. Roman Eleven Young was clicking his mouse fastly as he was facing his computer. He is the one that the landlord mentioned to the old lady, and he was living in this room. After he was discharged from the hospital, his room was full of garbage and it was too dark. Only his computer gave a light inside. He was typing on his keyboard and was searching for some information about Zinjian Group a business that was already running for five years in the industry. He also searched for a person named Zhang Zhang Chul on the web, and it says that this person resigned as the representative of Zhang's law firm because of his child's involvement in a school assault. Another piece of information he is searching for is the Blue Wing Media and lastly is the stars. All of the information he searched are connected with the murder case of his parents as he knew that those criminals have able to escape since their parents are people with a high background. Roman Eleven Young was seriously reading the article, but his phone suddenly rang and when he looked at it, he instantly saw his picture of the time when he was a baby and he was carried by his father while his mother is beside them. 
Upon seeing it, he felt sad as he misses his parents so much. Instead of answering the phone, he decided to ignore it, but it continuously rang and someone sent him several messages. When he was about to stand, he heard someone knock on the door and he was emotionless. While walking towards it, he heard a voice asking him to open the door. Is it wrong to write one minute instead of ten minutes his visitor said. The person even offered of calling the hospital if she wanted to see his teacher. His visitor is a lady who was standing waiting for him to open the door. Si Young then opened the door and he instantly covered his eyes as he saw the light from the sun and he was not used to it. The lady then went inside and was complaining about why Young choose to stay on the rooftop. When Si Young closed the door the lady was annoyed and asked him to on the light. Si Young then followed what she was asking for and lady saw several bags of garbage inside the room. Hey you need to live like a human like a person. What is this? She said with annoyance and Si Young only sighed. The lady walked towards the computer and asked what Si Young is doing, but then she didn't expect an answer from Si Young, and he instantly informed Young that she have a blind date so they need to quickly finish checking Young's condition since she was. Si Young just look at her without giving any response. His nurse was slightly lean her on the table, while asking about the arms, legs, back, eyes and headache of Si Young and everything of these Si Young answered that it still hurts a little. The nurse then recorded it on the note, and she also put 140 over 100 on the blood pressure of Si Young. She then sighed as she was sad to see Si Young still wasted and seems no care of himself. The nurse reminded him that he should stop what he was doing to himself, and she said that it's been two years already, and both she and Si Young's doctor were about at their limits letting this go on. While she was talking, she noticed that Si Young is not listening to her. Si Young is typing a message on his phone and his nurse received a text message coming from him. When she read it, it makes her annoyed out shouted at Si Young that she didn't say all these good things to him just to get paid. She was just worried that Si Young will be stuck this way. Si Young stared at his nurse and his nurse was irritated at him and decided to walk away. Even if you don't go back to school, at least take a step outside, right? She uttered. She was hoping that Seung will have the confidence to meet some people again for his own good and recovery. She then opens the door and leaves Young behind. But still Si Young doesn't care at all. He continues to sit on his computer and connected his phone. He opens an app with the logo of F and when he tried to access it, he immediately checked the private chat of the people he knows the most. But he wasn't able to enter as he was restricted and also prohibited from accessing it. Roman 11 Young then tried it on his computer and have done troubleshooting to open it. And when he looked at his phone, he successfully opened the private chat and it was the chat of his parents' murderer. Upon reading it, he found out that five of these people were now in the US and were hoping that they can be able to go back to Korea. They were also careful not to let other people know where they are right now. After reading it, Si Young slammed his phone on the table and stood while gritting his teeth because he still remembered what these people did to him back then. He turned around and decided to lie down on his bed. While he was lying, he was panting rapidly. He felt sad and in pain for so long, and he cannot let it go. Above the roof, Si Young can be seen at the same time. Something flashing going toward the earth. It was a long sword coming from the other world, and it unexpectedly landed on the rooftop of the building where Roman 11 Young is staying, and it creates a huge explosion. Si Young immediately woke up and was startled upon hearing a loud noise. He instantly stood up and was terrified as he was very sure that the sound didn't come from below. And it sounds like something striking into something. Roman 11 Young slowly walked towards the door and was still confused about what it is. He even thinks that it might be a thief or those people who bullied him to death while thinking these thoughts. His chest was suddenly in pain. His sweat dropped all over his body and his hands were trembling. Nevertheless, he decided to face his fears and continuously walk towards the door. His door has several locks to open it and when he finally unlocked it, there was a dazzling light coming from the outside. When Si Young opened it wide, the light was blinding him but he forced himself to stare and check what it really is. 
His eyes rounded, and he was flustered as he saw a flaming sword that was stuck on the floor at the rooftop. Si Young was standing still staring and wondering about where the sword came from. He has a lot of questions including who's the owner of this sword, why it landed in front of his room, and how it happened. He was full of confusion as he cannot think of an answer. He went near the sword and observed it. It was like a sword that he usually saw in the online game, either a two-handed sword or a zwee-hander. The sword is taller than him, and he noticed that it doesn't look like it's in that deep, and he concludes that it may be loosely stuck. He was confused about how it's stuck since the door to the stairs is still locked. He was thinking so much. But nothing comes into his mind so he screamed out of annoyance. The people below the building were startled upon hearing him. Roman Eleven Young continuously screamed while holding his head. He sighed and decided not to get curious about this sword and just ignore it. He turned around and went inside his room. He walked towards his bed and lie down again as he decided to just ignore his confusion about this new Excalibur legend. Stuck on his roof, Si Young slept again while the sword outside his room suddenly make a loud noise. He heard a drumbeat which made him irritated. When he opened his eyes, he saw a knight playing a horn together with several knights stomping around and Si Young found himself in the middle of them. He was sweating as he was frightened and confused. What makes him more shocked is seeing different kinds of monsters. There was also a man wearing a cape standing in the front and fearlessly facing the monsters. One thing he noticed is the sword that was stuck on his roof. He saw that the man in front of him is holding it. As he was about to think of it, there was like a strong wind sipping him in, which made him unable to react. He did his best to hold back until the strong wind disappears. When he opened his eyes, he was shocked upon seeing those monsters stuck to the sword like a magnet. There was also a flame in his surroundings. He was staring closely at it and his sense suddenly came back to reality. He was looking around and confused about what just happened, and then he realized that he was just dreaming. But then he heard a loud noise again coming from the outside. He stood and concludes that it may be not be a dream. He walked towards the door and checked it himself, and he was flustered seeing the sword up in flames again. Surprisingly, the flames suddenly grew stronger. Literally a sea of fire. Roman Eleven Young covered his face with both of his hands and immediately rushed inside his room to get some water. He grabbed the pail of water, but he was too weak to pull it as it was too heavy. Decided to lessen the water and when he finally carried it, he immediately went back outside and rushed to the sword to spill the water on it, hoping that the flame will disappear. But still, the flame continues which made him annoyed and went back to his bathroom to get more water. He was screaming out of annoyance, but then he was able to put out the fire after how many minutes of splashing some water on the sword, his hands looked so weak. After carrying a pail of water several times, he was trembling and tired. When he started to stand up, his body was in pain and he was shaking as it hurts a lot. When he looked behind him, he saw a hose and a faucet, and because of it, he was irritated once again as he was so tired carrying the pail of water from the bathroom. After four days, the time is around 12 midnight and Si Young woke up after taking a nap. He gets up and yawns. He took a deep breath and walked towards the door. Upon checking the sword it was flaming again, but he was a bit used to it as it happens four days in a row. As usual, he on the faucet and grabbed the hose to put out the fire. At this moment, he was thinking about where the drum beat is coming from as he always heard it when he woke up. And up until this time, he was still curious about this fire and the sword that always appeared. All of a sudden, he was staring into the sword, hoping that he can get an answer. But still he cannot think of any reason. The next day, he heard the drumbeat again. He wanted to sleep more, but he can't because of the noise and this makes him furious. Another day has passed, but Si Young is not on his bed or on his room. He was outside staring at the sword, waiting for the flame to appear to answer some of his confusion. Twelve midnight have passed and the sword was shaking. He then grips into the hose and saw the fire start to arise. Before the fire becomes strong, he immediately splashes the water on the sword and the fire went down. But still, in just a few seconds, the fire came back and Roman Eleven Young did the same thing. 
He then smiled. When the flame was gone, he went into his computer and searched for some information on how to get rid of this flaming sword. After how many hours of searching, he gladly found a possible answer. He went back outside, standing in front of the sword. When the sword is shaking, Si Young then ready the things he needed, a cross and holy water. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. He uttered and sprayed holy water on the sword. He was silent and observing the things that will happen. But unfortunately, the flame still appeared which made Roman Eleven Young startled. He grits his teeth and tried some ritual again as he thought that the sword was owned by Satan. He continued spraying holy water until he began to feel tired. Due to his annoyance, he throw the holy water in the holy cross as it was not working at all. But the good thing is that the fire goes out during the day and was only burning up just a while ago. He looks up above while thinking that he will suppose to experience this flaming sword again tonight. He was annoyed and he clenched his fist as he cannot take it anymore. He was staring at the sword and vowed that he will finish this sword today. He then gets some tools as he decided to destroy the sword, he grips his hammer and smiled as he thought that his hammer can really finish this mysterious sword. He breathed deeply and rushed to the sword while still holding the hammer. At this point, he hit the sword with all his strength. But surprisingly, the sword remained fine and his hammer was the one that got damaged. When he looked at his sword, he was annoyed to see that his hammer didn't even leave a scratch on this mysterious thing. His sweat was dripping, and he rushed inside his room to search for another thing that can possibly break the sword. When he comes out, he was already carrying a bat. He focused on the sword again and grips on his bat. He screamed loudly and hit the sword with the bat, hoping that it will break this time. Upon hitting the sword, his bat bounced back and hit his face. The bat spun above and Roman Eleven Young fell on the floor with a lump on his head, his body was shaking in pain and his head hurts a lot. He gets up and clenched his fist while staring at the sword with anger. So wanna go all out until the end, right? He uttered. He put both of his hands on the sword and ready his body. He was about to utter something, but then his mood changed as he saw the fire starting to flame up again. The flame instantly becomes strong. It's on fire all of a sudden, which made Young confused. Since this sword only flames at midnight, and it's not midnight yet. His eyes then rounded upon looking at the sword, and he becomes puzzled as he witnessed the flame rising, and there was like a sun appeared that creates a dazzling light. This round thing is sipping in the flame until the flame slowly disappeared on. Expectedly, it strikes an overwhelming power to see young, and the flame was entering his body from his mouth and eyes. And at this moment, there were a lot of memories started emerging in his mind, causing him to feel a headache. He was screaming in pain, and he feels that his head is splitting apart. He grits his teeth as he was fighting the pain, and the memories continuously entered his mind. He saw several people, and as he screamed loudly while gripping the sword, he suddenly pulled it away from being stuck on the floor. The sword was very long and heavy, causing him to fall. He was sweating and suddenly lose consciousness, but still slightly holding the sword because of the loud noise he created. For how many days, people from the lower building wondered about the noise, and they were complaining as they cannot sleep due to the loud coming from the rooftop for two-three hours in the middle of the night. These women who were gossiping were also a renter of this building, and they noticed that the person from the rooftop is banging around and the sound comes right through the ceiling. The lady wearing a blue cloth says that her husband is more intrigued by it than angry, they even didn't have any idea if the owner is a man or a woman and did not also know his age because of the noise. One of these ladies called the management to report this matter, despite that, they heard loud noises in the middle of the night. The management also told them that they'll be the ones to reach out to the owner and check, so these renters should only wait until then. Meanwhile, Roman Eleven Young gained consciousness and he suddenly screamed once more. Without any reason he gets up and holds his head. He was wondering if all those scenes he saw is just a dream, but still he felt that it was too real. More likely, memory of happiness, despair, sadness moved, fury, guilt, hatred. All these emotions sprang up as if they were alive. 
as if Si Young lived through ages, untold and unimaginable. He was full of confusion, which only gave him a headache. When he looked beside him, he saw the sword, and he was flustered about why this sword is also beside him. What makes him more shocked is seeing the floor with no sign of this sword having stuck anywhere, and also noticed that the sword is about a meter longer than when it was stuck on the rooftop. If it was that long, he wondered if it wouldn't have stuck through to the ceiling of the floor below. When he tried to carry the sword, his body was trembling. He raises the sword and tried to lean it on the wall. But the sword was too heavy and falls back on his thin body. He screamed loudly as it was too painful. After trying so hard, he finally leans the sword on the wall. He was so tired and was wiping his sweat. He then stared at the sword and hold it from the memory that emerges in his mind. He recalled that the name of this sword is War Sword, a bringer of thunder and storm. That wasn't the true name of the sword, but someone called it that on a whim. His chest was in pain all of a sudden as he was remembering this thing. What is important is that you remain unmoved, unchanged, that you bend, nor and break, not in your courage and the will to fight. This was the statement that Roman Eleven Young remembered was said by the first owner of the sword. He grabbed the sword and carried it with his bare hands. He was holding it like was about to battle. He closes his eyes and told himself that it will depend on him how to fight with this sword freely and without restriction. He was thinking about the movement that was on his head, and he imagined that he carried and swing this sword just like how the main owner of this sword did. What he knows is he only needs to follow the images in his head. He focused himself while pointing the sword in the middle. He grits his teeth as he tried to raise the sword. When he successfully made it, he smiled widely as he thought that it was just too easy. He tried to swing it, but the sword dropped and the quillins of the sword hit his shoulder. He screamed in pain but despite of that, he still tried several times. But still he cannot perform the images that he saw in his mind, and it only makes him feel tired. On the same day, his nurse came to him. His nurse was staring at him in confusion, but Roman Eleven Young was just staring into nothing. I thought it was unusual that you called me first, but what the hell is with this? She asked with crossed arms before she came to Siung's house. She was in the Risto as she has a date with someone. She was enjoying talking with the man in front of her. But her phone suddenly rang, and she doesn't have a choice but to answer it. The moment she answered the call, it was Si Young asking for him. She was worried. Upon hearing Young's painful voice, she immediately stood and apologizes to the man as she needs to go to Young. She didn't wait for any answer from the man and instantly run away. The man called her, but she didn't look back and only said that there's something came up so she have to leave you know I kicked a man to the curbs for this, and what the hell is this, she asked, but Si Young remained silent. She already put a bandage on Young's hands, and she was so curious about what exactly have Young did to sprain the ligaments in both of his wrists. She said that Si Young's back and hips were also sprained. Si Young was still not looking at her, but he answered that he was just exercising. His nurse was shocked upon hearing it. She chuckled with happiness as he was glad to know that Si Young, who hasn't stepped outside of his front door for two years, was exercising now. Must have been some kind of exercise to lay you up like this on. My? How unusual. The nurse uttered while tapping Si Young's tummy with her finger. She smiled widely while saying that Si Young was doing CrossFit for two hours or lifting weights 100 times to get a lot of sprains all over his body. Her happiness was cut off when she heard Si Young's phone ring. Upon checking the call is from the happiness realty, Si Young tried to get up, but he was struggling. So his nurse is the one who answered the phone. She let the caller know that she was the nurse of Si Young from the He Won University Hospital. My name is Kim Bara. I'm in charge of Taxi Young Kun's regular checkups, she said with annoyance. The caller mentioned that the renters of the lower floor in this building have complained about Si Young screaming. Every midnight, Kim looks at Si Young with confusion and the caller asked her about Si Young's condition. She then answered that Si Young seems fine now and also his mental condition is perfectly good. Kim reminded the happiness realty to just text Si Young in case they have some questions. 
Since she knows that Si Young usually doesn't answer calls very often, she walked towards Si Young and instructed him to at least make some noise to let the realty know that he was fine. Since the boss of the management company is worried about him, Si Young answered okay, and he also let the management know that it was him who answered. You heard him right? Yes of course, I understand. Yes I'll tell him. Kim uttered and hang up the call. She become annoyed once again and asked Si Young about what the management is talking about. She was mad by the fact that there were a lot of tenants in the building complaining that Si Young have been going crazy in the middle of the night, screaming so loud for how many days. Si Young avoided answering his nurse which made Kim stare at him with anger. When he saw Kim's eyes, he was frightened so he just reasoned out that he was frustrated with everything and he feels like he could explode any time. Kim was about to say something on Nasi, but she decided to just be quiet and understand his patient's pain. All this time she was sad about what happened to Si Young and she feels pity to see Si Young living his life alone. Kim was the one who take good care of Si Young back when the time that Si Young was still in the hospital. She was the one who helped Si Young to eat and to always check Young's condition. After hearing about what happened to Si Young and his parent, she felt sad. While she was remembering these things, she heard Si Young say that he was fine now. Si Young told her that already calmed down a lot. Si Young turned his head to the side while saying that he wanted to take a nap for a bit. All right then change the bandages regularly and the cast take it off when you have to move the joint. But don't do that too often because the swelling's not gonna go down. Regular massaging is good for that, so try it even if it hurts. Got it? Kim responded to Si Young with excitement, but Si Young ignored her. She turned around while informing Si Young that she will visit regularly. Si Young rattled upon hearing it as he doesn't want that Kim will know what is hiding in his room. Before leaving, Kim was planning when she should be back to visit Si Young, and she decided that she will be starting to visit Si Young the week after next week every Tuesday and Thursday. Si Young was about to resist, but Kim insisted and left so Si Young won't have the chance to react. Si Young was trembling as he forced himself to get up, since he wanted to chase his nurse to tell her that he don't need her to check him regularly. But then Si Young cannot be able to move quickly yet because of his sprain. After Kim left, Si Young was still lying inside. He then remembered the sword and checked behind his bed to make sure that it was still in his room. He sighed once more while hanging his head on the bed. He decided to grab the sword and he was shaking as he tried to pull it. He then put it on his bed and he was full of sweat and his sprain was in pain. Both of his hands were trembling. After forcing to carry the sword all of a sudden, he heard a voice of a man stating that Si Young has an excellent beginning. It also said that the one who never falls never learns how to get back up. Si Young was nervous upon hearing it. He immediately turned around to check if there was someone behind him, but then it's just him inside and the voice he heard was familiar to him. It's better to fall when you're a fledgling because if you fall when you're bigger, you worry more about the embarrassment, the voice added. Si Young was terrified by the voice in his head. This unknown voice even told him that the path to power is so simple. He just needs to run with the sword and swing the sword until exhaustion takes him. Si Young leans down on his bed while thinking about what it means to run with the sword and swing it. He was so clueless about how he gonna get powerful by just doing it. Roman Eleven Young turned to his computer and decided to search for an answer. Since he believes that only the internet can help him with his confusion, he searched on the web about the two-handed sword. He was so focused, hoping that he could get an answer. He found a lot of articles, but one article that catch his attention is the post of a person who practiced with a two-handed sword for four months. When Si Young click it, there was a video, and he found out that this poster is from Korea. The poster showed some of his movements. First is balancing the center of gravity on the sword itself, then economizing the movement and cutting through the opponent. While watching the video, Si Young was imagining that he applied these tips. He believes that he can learn by just following these steps. But up until this time, his whole body was still trembling in pain. He looked at the sword and remembered the statement from the back of his head. 
The path of power is to run with the sword and swing it until exhaustion takes him. The time of Kim's visit to Seun came, and when she checked Young's sprain, she was surprised. Was about to heal from what she deduces, it should heal for about three weeks. Because of this, she concludes that Si Young has put some strange medicine or something to his sprain without telling his nurse. But Si Young didn't give her an answer. She then decided to leave while instructing Seung not to overdo his sprain. Hey yo, if some shit happens to you, all that shit flows downhill to me, okay? You got that or not? She added. And Si Young only gives her a sign to just leave, which made Kim feel a little bit annoyed and slammed the door after leaving. When Roman 11 Young confirmed that his nurse is not around, he immediately gets up. And he also checked his hands. He can now be able to clench it without feeling some pain. Heated in the forge and ripe for the hammer's blow, what fool would wait until it cools again? The voice in his mind stated he carried the sword and the voice told him to leave this place and run at once and swing as if his life depends on it. Because of this, he wondered if the person behind this voice might be watching him. He comes out from his room together with the sword. He carried it with his bare hands and tried to raise it. His whole body was trembling because of forcing himself. Since the sword was too heavy, his body gave up and put back the tip of the sword. He concludes that it's better for him to get his strength than stamina. First, he planned to go outside to run and never mind the neighborhood. Since it's been two years he have been down the stairs. He doubt he's got enough stamina to run. So he decided to do it later on. In his memory, the owner of the sword has always run. Every 12 midnight, while carrying the sword on his back, he becomes stronger by just eating and running some more. Si Young tied a belt on each side of the sword to put on it on his shoulder, just like a bag. And he also tied a red cloth on it to make sure that it will not fall from his body. He was standing while clenching both of his hands and exhaling deeply while wondering how many push-ups he could do with this sword. In just a few seconds, his body was already trembling and he was thinking that he might be able to get 30 push-ups. He hasn't been doing any exercise since then, and accounting for the weight of the sword, he changed his prediction from 30 push-ups. He believes that he might only get 10. Before he started, he was already sweating when he tried it. He felt that it was too hard since the sword is very heavy, and at the end, he decided to just get one push-up instead of 10. When he lowered his body, he was shaking. He grits his teeth and his face ended up sunk into the floor. He heard the voice again, reminding him to run and swing the sword until exhaustion takes him. Because of this voice, he was thinking that he was going to be insane. He didn't get up for a minute and he sighed due to his disappointment. Meanwhile, Si Young has eaten a lot of cup noodles. He was currently lying his half-body on the bed and he instantly gets up as he decided to run with the sword. Since he believes that there wouldn't be a lot of people around, he then carried the sword on his back and he breathed deeply. He then faced at the rooftop door and this will be the first time in two years that he will come out from this rooftop. He started by coming out on the door of his floor and he was sweating and shaking as he slowly walked up the stairs. He then informed himself that he should run until exhaustion takes him with this. Just one flight of stairs and he already feels his entire body is breaking while he is being careful. Slowly walking on the stairs, hoping that no one will see him, the sword unfortunately bumped into the stringer of the stair, which make him umped into the stringer of the stair, which made him stumble and instantly fall. Despite it, he still motivates himself by thinking of the statement of the voice in his head. He told himself that he will keep running whatever it takes. He continuously walked on the stairs and rested a little time and continued again until he felt exhausted. On his first day, he didn't run outside the building. But he only walked down the stairs and went up again and did a total of four round trips. Upon thinking that he cannot do it anymore, he believes that he was already completely exhausted when he was about to surrender. Those students who had beaten him and murdered his parents suddenly appeared in his mind and he remembered how his parents were buried alive. Because of this, his chest is aching. He grits his teeth and grips the belts on his shoulder and decided to try one more as he was so obsessed with becoming stronger. Several weeks later, a bunch of garbage bags were outside the building. 
which made one tenant dumbfounded. And as expected, this garbage came from the room of Roman Eleven Young. At this moment, he was lying in bed with the sword at the top of his body. When he got up, he suddenly felt hungry, so he immediately cooked some food to eat. Even if he was cooking, he still carried the sword on his back, and it seems like he was used to it. While he was cooking, he wondered why he was still hungry, even though he eats several times after Si Young ate, he was doing some push-ups. And this time he can easily do 100 push-ups without resting. After doing 100 push-ups, he suddenly heard the voice saying that the less rest period he has between exercises, the harder it is to transform his skin and the muscle behind it. He gets up and removes the sword from his back. And the voice instructs him to find peace in the violence of his movement and ecstasy in the pain that brings. With the help of these words, Si Young was motivated to try harder. He then ran on the stairs back and forth, and he gained a lot of changes in his movement. He can now easily run with the sword in his back without resting a bit and has cleared eight times round trips. He stared at the sword as he decided to practice swinging it. He first raises the sword and holds tightly to it. The voice instructed him to start with 100 swings. It even demanded him to slowly swing the sword so slow that it would cause him to yawn in boredom. As he watched Si Young, Si Young Da positioned his feet and started swinging the sword slowly. But then the owner of the sword stated that the tip of the sword wavers does not count. Si Young then tried once more in a counterclockwise direction. The voice asked his purpose of what he was doing right now and what is the goal behind this determination of him. And only one thing comes into his mind and that is to get revenge for his parents. When Roman Eleven Young was done with his training, he then sat at his computer and checked the video that was captured when his parents were being burned alive. He touches his PC as he feels pity for his parents being murdered mercilessly. He was crying in pain while squeezing his legs with annoyance. He screamed so loud, stating that his main goal of hard work is revenge. Si Young lay down on his bed. But he was still crying in sorrow. He decided to get up and wiped out his tears. Outside his room, Nurse Kim was slowly walking to surprise his patient Si Young. He sent a message to Si Young saying that she was outside, and she chuckled as she thought that Si Young doesn't have any idea. But then, before knocking on the door, she was startled as it suddenly opened. Si Young was standing fiercely and Nurse Kim was confused about how Si Young knew that she was already outside. But then, Si Young only told her that she should act with her age. Kim entered Si Young's room with annoyance to think that Si Young killed her happiness. But then, Si Young only sighed at her actions. As usual, Kim was here to check Si Young's condition. Si Young also informed her that his blood pressure is 175 over 110. Kim asked about his arm, and he answered that it still hurts a little. The lady stared at him with annoyance while saying that both of them are in this case together, and she knows that they both don't go along. But she was just hoping that Si Young will answer her questions honestly. Your ligaments in your wrists and ankles, are they okay? How about your back? She asked and Young answered, the same thing hurts a little, which made Kim irritated as she knows that Seung is just lying. She smirked and said that Si Young's doctor wrote a report that Seung had pretty much all recovered. Si Young was shocked upon hearing it, and Nurse Kim said that Si Young cannot goof off anymore. She also mentioned that Si Young will be able to go back to school, and was hoping that Si Young will interact with other kids and make friends with them. Since Si Young was traumatized by the school, he was clenching his fist and trembling in anger while listening to his nurse. Nurse Kim said that nobody will be able to bully Si Young this time. While she was talking, she noticed Si Young slowly walking near her and standing with his head down. I will not be going back to school. He uttered with angry tone and Kim was stuttering as she answered. Yes, did you hear what I said? Si Young asked and Kim uttered Si Young's name. Si Young was flustered and he was startled when Kim suddenly asked surprisingly. When did Si Young get so tall? She explained that Si Young wasn't even 160 cm before, while she was 168 cm. But now she can see that Si Young is much taller than her right now. She ordered Si Young to stand up straight to confirm if Si Young really became tall, 
and she wondered how she did not notice this before she suddenly moved away while staring at Si Young's neck and body. While observing his body, she saw a lot of changes from Si Young, including his body becoming a boulder. She was tapping Young's body and she couldn't hold herself and squeezed Young's breasts. Her eyes sparkled as he felt how hard it is. After an hour since Nurse Kim had left, Si Young started his training by swinging the sword with his heart set on strength, grasped the overwhelming power, the foolish confined themselves within limits. They set and split themselves into the strong and the weak and struggle to stand above those who crawl below. Yet heaven and the sun do not exist in multitudes, nay they are but one each, thus they do not struggle for power. It was said by the voice at Si Young's head. Because of this motivational statement, Si Young can finally swing the sword easily, as much as he could while he was training himself. He recalled the pledge of indomitability, the blessing of the sword, and the essence of faith. From running until exhaustion takes him, the endless training of his body and mind, he can force himself past the limit. And at that moment, he will obtain the first power, the pledge of indomitability. And after the pledge of indomitability, from swinging his two-handed sword war sword 10,000 times without a pause in one day, he will obtain the blessing of the sword. When the pledge of indomitability and the blessing of the sword, the almost unlimited power of the essence of faith, will be born within his body. It is what Roman 11 Young remembered from a silver memory he has. But up until now he was still confused if this was really his memory. If so, he can say that he has barely started walking compared to the guy who is the owner of the sword. In his memory, he was staring at the sword and was very determined to train himself more. One year later, a politician was doing a public speech on the media, and it was played. You as a citizens have reaffirmed today whether your own country is with hope or without hope. Through this election, we have proven that our country is with hope, and that our collective patriotism can overcome our individual selfishness. Other politicians might place conditions on themselves to their time to approach things slowly. Not with me. However, there would be no conditions placed on your support and your desires. That's not merely my commitment, but it is the promised trust you have placed upon my shoulder. Who would dare to oppose us? Who would dare to foster hostile intent in their hearts against us? He proclaimed, and after his speech, someone congratulated him, thinking that this man have made his dream come true. Well, this is but a start, he answered and laughed. He said that he was doing this for the country. His name is Zhang Sung Chu, the 21st president elected. While he was talking to someone, his bodyguard informed him that he has a call from President Lai from the Xinjian group. When he answered it, the first word he heard is congratulations. Soon Chu then thanked him and acknowledged that it was because of his help. Xinjian group president invited him to have a get-together with their family to celebrate the victory of Chu. Those kids had a hard time in the S. It's past time they get back, Sung Chu answered. And he was referring to those kids who murdered Si Young's parents. At the time that he was doing a public speech on the media, Si Young was also watching with a grudge against him. One year has passed and Si Young still has the sword. Going back to Chul, he mentioned that those kids have been kept in the dark. And he believes that they were all having a hard time. And he can't even remember the last time he saw his son Sian. So he misses his kids so badly. After he hang up the call, his assistant immediately approached him to say that it appears Su Young is set to return. Yes, she had it hard, but I'm sure she all grown up, he answered, and the assistant feels that it may be also hard for Sung Chul as a father of Su Young. But then Soon Chul said that those bad things have happened in the past. He believes in the saying the ground gardens after it rains. Despite what those kids have done, he was still thankful for the reason that they as parents got a chance to get together and plan for a great thing. You are correct, Mr. Chairman, the assistant uttered. After saying it, he then guffawed while standing at the view from the window glass. At the same time, at the Incheon International Airport, two bolder men were in the elevator, and they were together with three of those students who murdered Si Young's parents after how many years in the S, they are now finally back here in Korea. The lady in the middle with a thin body and green hair is Yujin. Beside her with white hair and not so tall is Jun Hayek, 
and the other tall man with them is Su Ho. After exiting the elevator, three men were waiting for them and smiling at them widely. They were also the criminals of the murder case of Young's parents, namely Hai Yun, Chang Tsu and Da Hun. They then greet each other and they were all glad and excited that they were now together again after so many years. Hai Yun noticed that Su Hyun and Su Young is not with them. Yu Jin then answered that she has no idea since those two snuck off to Japan, and Su Yun told her that she wanted to cool her head for a couple of days, and Su Hyun, well you know right, she added, and Jun Hyuk stated that Sayung has been doing this past two years was cooling her head, so he doesn't know what Sayung means of cooling her head again in Japan, and also he feels bad for Su Hyun. They then started moving, and while leaving Jun Hayek and Chang Tzu decided to stay behind. Jun Hayek then asked Chang Tzu if he already checked Young's information and Chang Tzu casually answered yes, good job, Jun Hayek said, while tapping Chang Tzu's shoulder. Then they look into each other's eyes and Chang Tzu believes that Jun Hayek is planning on brewing something. Jun Hayek smiled and answered of course. Who do you think we have to thank for all the shit we've gone through? He added. At the same time, Si Young was talking to his aunt over the phone, and his aunt tried to force him to go back to school. But Se Young didn't want to. His aunt said that he can't stay like this forever. And she suggested that Si Young can move to her house with her, and she can be comfortable if Si Young will stay with them so no one can bother him. I'll think about it. But still, I'm afraid of the world. Si Young answered. His aunt felt sad, and she apologized to Si Young as she thought that she had put so much pressure on Si Young then answered that she didn't. He understood that his aunt was just worried about him. His aunt bids goodbye to him and reminds him to be mindful of his health. After the call, Si Young fell down while holding the two-handed sword. While thinking that the time will come, he will crush those people who make him suffer. Outside of the building, there was a man standing and he was talking to someone over the phone. He said that there has been no sign of anyone entering or leaving, and they even observed the location from a high rise with a direct view several times today, but still the same. We've tried delivery post and even meter reading, but we've not been successful in confirming whether the target resides in this location. There was no response from the inside at all, he said. When this news was received by Jun Hayek, he was so annoyed. Especially that Chang Tzu didn't even get a picture of Young. Chang Tzu then reminded him that he already said Si Young never ever steps outside of his place. He was holding a photo of the building where Roman Eleven Young leave, and he was annoyed knowing that Si Young didn't also go to school. Maybe we'll ask the uncles to barge in, Chang Tzu suggested. But Jun Hayek was confused. Chang Tzu then explained that Jun Hayek can pick the lock and rush into Young's room and grab Young and have a little fun with him before dragging him to their group. Jun Hayek was surprised upon hearing it and he laughed so hard while hugging Chang Tzu. Chang Tzu, you're beautiful. You are the one who brightens my day. You know only you, he said. Chang Tzu asked him if he would do it and he answered that they need to be cautious. He believes that if they want to do it, they have to raise the level to at least what Su Hyun might be planning. Chang Tzu was confused about what Jun Hayek is trying to say. And Jun Hayek concludes that Chang Tzu really believes that Su Hyun went to Japan with Su Young just so they could play. He then smirked and guffered while saying that Su Hyun got an invitation from the Yakuza, and that is the real reason why they are not here in Korea yet. Chang Tzu was shocked how it happened. So Jun Hayek explained that both Hyun and Su Young made some friends while they were in Japan. And the parents of these new friends they have met were Yakuza. And while they were boarding the plane, Su Hyun said that Si Young deserves this present from them. On the same day, Si Young saw the posts of these people on social media together. Because of his anger, he grips hard into his phone and stares at their faces with a grudge. He also read the caption and realized that both Sayang and Su Hyun are not with them yet. Su Young put down his phone while whispering into his head that he's also here waiting for them to get back together at the Narita International Airport. I thought you said it might take one or two more years. But thanks to Sayang's dad being elected as president, I guess that I got the gears turning earlier.
the lady said while facing both Sion and Su Hyun. She and the man beside her are both new friends of Sion and Su Hyun that Jun Haek mentioned, who has Yaku's appearance. They then entered the limousine and decided to continue talking while they were on their way. Lai Si Hyun is part of the Xinjin group and the son of board chairman Lai Zhu Zhang. Beside him is the 21st president-elect, Zhang Song Chu's daughter named Zhang Su Young. While they were on their way riding in the limousine, they were facing each other and the man with them, named Ryao Hai, wanted Su Hyun to discuss their plans straight to the point. The lady beside him is his sister, and she said that she contacted her brother the moment that Su Hyun told her that they will stop by in Japan. Thanks, Su Hyun replied. No, thank you. No one would have imagined that I would get to know Su Young. No. The daughter of the president of Korea when I went to study abroad in the S. Ryu. He uttered, and Su Young gave thanks for his assistance. It's only natural between friends Ryu, he replied. He proudly said that his father leads the Three Paths Association and took a special interest with this matter. While he was boasting, Su Hyung was just listening to him. If everything is ready, then we can depart as early as tomorrow. Then, Su Young asked and Ryohei said that they can relax for now here in Japan and get back to Korea whenever. Su Hyung was dumbfounded upon hearing it, and the lady with them said that it was pretty cute. Seeing them all surprised. Su Young at the same time was annoyed as they expected that they could go back to Korea as soon as possible. Ryao Hai then explained that they already have operators in Busan on a business trip, and they got in contact with these operators just this morning, and he will introduce them to Sion and Su Hyun soon. I told them you guys would handle the wrap-up yourselves, so consider them your men for the time being, he added. And Sion's mood then changes as he realizes that Rao, he indeed has a good plan. All of a sudden, Si Hyun's phone rang as he received a message. When he checked it, he frowned, which made Hyung intrigued to her surprise. Jun Hayek said that he wanted to play with their toy first as he gets too bored. While waiting for them going back to Korea, Jun Hayek ordered two men to visit Seung's room. It's already midnight, and these two men argued. The bald then reminded his companion that they should have done their mission quietly. The other man was annoyed that the bald man had the huts to educate him. He screamed loudly while complaining about accepting this kind of job. When they arrived, they saw that there were some regular people in the building. And the bald man then said that five minutes after the clock struck midnight and all the lights were off, they were hesitant to go. But at the end, the man with curly hair decided to come out of their vehicle and was still mocking the bald man. The bald man was also annoyed at his words. But then he went straight to the building and boasted that he can end this job easily and bring Si Young back with him in just a short period of time. Do what you want. The bald man answered inside. The man then fearlessly went inside and easily broke the lock of the gate going to Si Young's room. Upon entering the rooftop, he was hesitant to believe that there was really someone leaving here. He even complained that there's no window in this room. He got an idea as he remembered that they had a picture of this building, and there was a window on the roof. He was about to climb the roof, but the door suddenly opened, which made it easy for him to enter. When he peeked from the outside, he noticed that it was too dark, so he couldn't see anything. He was so clueless that Si Young was just standing right in front of him. One hour had passed and the bald man was already annoyed, Canyon, and he wondered why it took too long for him to come back. Since he was too pissed off waiting for his colleague, he decided to enter the building to check it himself. He then went directly to the rooftop and he noticed that the door was still open. He scratched his head while complaining as he thought that his colleague intentionally left the door open. Yo, you're going too long, he said as he was standing on the door. Before he could say more words, he saw a hand. Si Young grabbed his face and pulled him over leaving no evidence outside Si Young's room the next day there were some police officers checking the vehicle that was parked outside the building. Upon checking they saw that this vehicle has a temp tag and that they decided to tow the vehicle and according to them, the guys driving these things don't even come back for their cars, they only say it's not theirs half the time. They were hoping that there's enough on the record to make that much contact. 
One officer also mentioned that this building is under special surveillance, and the order comes from the top that they should check this place from time to time. At the same time, in the condominium of Chang Tzu at this moment, he received a message from Su Young accusing him that he's the one who helped Jun Hayuk to call some people to play. Jun Hayuk was with him, and he asked about what happened to their two men they assigned to catch Si Young, but then Chang Su didn't respond and only sighed. It's already 11 in the morning, but they didn't get any news which made Jun Hayuk annoyed. Chang Su said that he tried to call those men, but they didn't answer. John Haik screamed and ordered Chang Su to call them back. Chang Su was already annoyed at him, but he doesn't have a choice but to follow his demand. Since those men are not answering, Chang Su decided to call his uncle who is the handler of those men Ha's Choi Zhang Chan, the Miracred Agency president. Chang Su my boys got the job done right, he said as he was expecting that his men would do their mission without any problem. But then he was shocked when Chang Su answered that he hadn't heard anything from those men yet. Jiang Chan was wondering where his boys were and Chang Su said that those kids might be new in this kind of job. Jiang Chan was annoyed with how Chang Su called his boys as kids, but he didn't say anything about it and only told Chang Su that he will check his men first and will call back once he gets the news. Before hanging up, Chang Su reminded him that he was in a hurry. If I had known this would happen, I'd have just called Uncle Chang Hyun at Aegis, he added. And Jiang Chen was already trembling in anger. He was squeezing his phone, but he was powerless to say some words with a grudge. Since Chang Tzu is his older brother's son, he grits his teeth and screams about where his boys are right now. He tried to call them, but no one answered. He was so clueless that both of his men were beaten by. These men were full of bruises and already wounded, while their bones were sprained. And Si Young was just standing right beside them at the Incheon International Airport. Both Si Young and Su Hyun finally came back to Korea. Both of them were confused as they saw a lady standing in front of them. While saying that both of them had a difficult time, Si Young was confused about who she is. So she let them know that she's Nam Ho Young from the Secret Service. But still, Su Young was clueless why she appeared. Another man came, which made Su Hyun irritated. The man was about to say something, but he was distracted when Ho Yun grabbed Su Young's wrist, as she was instructed by Su Young's father to take her to him immediately. Su Young was calling Su Hyun, but Su Hyun was just staring at him, and Ho Yun also continuously grabbed her away from the other's point of view. There was a man sitting while answering a phone call from Zhang Chan. Zhang Chan was screaming over the phone while asking this man about the job that he was giving yesterday. He also ordered this man to find those boys and bring them to him as soon as possible. The man just sighed and hung up the call. He's Yandong Suk, the Miracred Agency Team 2 team leader. He reached out to his other boys to ask for some news and even the other people under him didn't have any idea either. He became curious, so he decided to go to see Young's place by himself. He comes out from his vehicle and stares at the building. His driver was very sure that this was the building where his two boys had a mission last night. He's wondering where his boys are, and even annoyed that those two men didn't even answer his calls. As he entered, he noticed something. He looked into it and was shocked to see on the paper their car registrar number. Because of this, he confirmed that his men really came here last night. But then he was still confused why those men didn't reach out yet from what he saw on the paper. The car was towed just this day at 1.21 in the morning. He was standing still while looking above, wondering what happened to his men. At the same time, Zhang Chan couldn't help but go to Dong Suk's office. But there has only been one man in charge since Dong Suk left. The man was startled upon seeing that it was the chairman. Zhang Chan sighed and was frowning. How are you doing, chairman? The man asked, hoping that he could change the mood. But then Zhang Chen continuously screamed, asking if where is everyone? The man was shaking in fear while explaining that the team leader had convened all of them to gather, and he said that he was also headed to them. Zhang Chan then asked who he was and where the others were going. Zhang Chan was speechless when the man answered that his team leader and the others were at Si Young's house. 
He immediately called Dong Suk and Dong Suk answered the call instantly. Zhang Chan was still screaming while asking him what he was doing. Dong Suk then honestly answered that he believes they might have a problem as two of their boys who were assigned to beat Si Young were missing. Zhang Chan was puzzled upon hearing it and Dong Suk told him that Young's building feels weird. So did you order our boys to go? Zhang Chan asked. Yes, I should go now to check on them. Dong Suk answered and Dong Chen is pleased to check those missing men so he can give an answer to Chang Tzu. Dong Suk thanked him for his patience and he then hung up the call. Behind him are his men and he then ordered them to go together inside Young's building. There were a lot of them and they were already heading inside the building to check those two missing men. They were still at the stairs and Dong Suk then ordered them to get Roman 11 Young. They forcefully opened the door on the rooftop by kicking it. They all then enter while Dong Suk is just chillin' in. The stairs, he walked as he heard someone shouting. While he was walking on the stairs, there was one man who was thrown from the rooftop and was full of bruises and was spitting blood. When Dong Suk saw it, he was shocked to see that it was one of his men. He was furious. While wondering about what was going on, all of a sudden someone appeared in front of him which made him startled. It was Si Young. Dong Suk was scared and instantly fell down. Si Young walked towards him and Dong Suk was begging him for mercy. But then, Si Young was ready to punch him. Si Young punched him in the face several times and the only thing he could do was scream. In the late afternoon, police officers came to the building since there was a tenant reporting it. The officer recorded on his note that the tenant heard screams a few times before and another several people screaming earlier. The complainant has complained that she hasn't slept because of this incident. Despite what she said, the officers were confused why the lady still reported it. They said that even if people like thugs come in, even if they have nothing to do with their home, they will still try to open doors. After recording what the complainant said, the officers then decided to check it themselves. While they were heading inside, one officer saw the padlock on the stairs. He then got it, and he confirmed that someone really got in here without permission. They concluded that those people might have escaped already. They immediately knocked on the rooftop door, and while knocking, they introduced themselves as the police officers, and they stated that they had received reports of screams coming from here. They then move aside as they noticed that there is already a person ready to open the door. Si Young appeared, and they were surprised because of how tall Young is. Especially that his body becomes bolder. One officer got a chance to have a glimpse on the rooftop, and he was shocked by what he saw. Despite that, he was trembling. He still pointed his gun to Si Young. While telling his co-officer to arrest Young immediately, the other officer was confused, so he said to look behind Young. The officer then glanced behind Si Young, but Si Young was emotionless and didn't care at all. Surprisingly, they saw those men from the Marakrid agency that were beaten by Si Young, and the rooftop was full of blood. Si Young was still standing in front of them without saying any words, and the officers were terrified at him. Meanwhile, Si Young was still on the rooftop together with the two police inspectors. But at this time, there are a bunch of policemen and an ambulance below the building as they have received the report about Young beating several men. The paramedics then carried the bodies from the rooftop to the ambulance to bring them all to the hospital. At the same time, Zhang Chan was also here as he decided to check Dong Suk and the others. But then he was terrified and flustered upon seeing bloody bodies on the scene and he was thinking that it might be his men at the rooftop. These two police officers are willing to arrest Si Young, but Si Young said that he doesn't have a citizen registrar number. Unintentionally, he addressed the police officer in front of a jossi, which made the officer feel insulted. Si Young explained that he's still 17, but will turn 18 this year, which is why he doesn't have a citizen registrar number yet. He also introduced himself, including his name and the last school he attended and he informed them that he took a break during his second year at the said school. He was about to say his reason, but the more he thought of it, the more he became annoyed. While looking at his angry face, the officer standing in front of him was frightened. The other officer was busy talking with the chief inspector over the phone. The chief ordered them to withdraw Si Young. 
The officer tried to disagree as he doesn't believe that Seung is still a minor because of how tall he is. Whether he broke their arms and legs or stabbed them with a knife, he's still a minor. A minor. You don't understand what I'm trying to say, the chief said with annoyance. Also, it happened at Si Young's house and not on the street. So he was thinking that Seung was just defending himself. The officer tried to resist, but the chief warned him that he will be the one to take all the responsibility once he will do something wrong to Young and piss off all the reporters in this country. The chief hung up the call and the officer was annoyed and squeezed his phone. His co-officer asked him what happened and he walked away and told answered him to withdraw Si Young. Despite that Si Young will not be arrested, he didn't show happiness. Instead, he remained emotionless after the police officer left. He then called his aunt to let her know that he has a plan to go to his aunt in Si Young to stay with them. Si Young said that he was sure about his decision, so the lady answered that she will talk to her husband and get the details sorted out. But then Si Young said that he didn't mean that he will go. Right now, I want to travel for about a year, Si Young uttered. He stated that he is still too young to travel safely out of the country, so he's going to travel around Korea. But Si Young even around Korea, and you have to restart your education, and delaying it for another year is, his aunt proclaimed. But before she could continue her statement, she noticed that Young became silent. Roman 11 Young then reasoned out that he had not been outside for so long, so he wanted to feel the wind on his face. He thinks that it will be good to get his head back to where it needs to be. Roman 11 Young was holding the sword while saying to his aunt that he doesn't want a lot of things weighing on his mind, and that his aunt should not worry if he will not contact the lady too frequently. His aunt felt down upon hearing Young saying over the phone that he will probably leave the room vacant for the most part. Even though the lady is worried, she still allowed Si Young, and she told Si Young that he must contact her from time to time so she doesn't worry too much. Si Young then agreed to her and hung up the call. From the other's point of view, Jun Hayek is calling Chang Tsu, and he was screaming on the phone. Chang Tsu answered his call, but was startled by the tone of his voice. Jun Hayek is already furious since it's been two days, but he still hasn't heard any news about those men who went to see Young's room. He blamed Chang Tzu since the men they hired were from Chang Tzu's uncle's agency. Chang Tzu reasoned out at him. But then John Hayek didn't want to listen to his reason, and he giggled, thinking that Su Hyun might come and clean up their dirt. And if that happens, he will have to watch Su Hyun be proud of himself. You can't even do what you're told properly anymore. At least in middle school, you are good at that at least, Jun Hayek uttered, which made Chang Tzu tremble in anger. Jun Hayek decided to hang up the call and instructed him not to call for a while. Chang Tzu grits his teeth while squeezing his phone and throwing it away. He was complaining about how Jun Hick said not to call him. But he was the one who called Chang Tzu this time. This anger of him makes his head hurt, but he cannot even say some bad words to John Hayek and only holds his anger. At the same time, Chang Su received another call. He looked into it and saw that it was Lai Su. He answered the call and Su Ho instantly told him that Su Hyun wanted to see him. Chang Su at this time was flustered since Su Hyun is much more worse than John Hayek. He then stood and answered that he would come. But before he could leave, Su Ho said that there was something he needed to bring. When Chang Tzu arrived at their spot, he immediately handed the photos of the building where Young leave and he smiled while saying that he was very sure that this is where Si Young can be found. He said that this building was Young's villa and his room is on the rooftop. Su Hyun was hesitant to believe with the reason that there was no strong evidence like a picture of Young in this building. Because of his attitude, Chang Su Fakli smiled while he was annoyed in his mind to think that Su Hyun and Jun Hayek talk like they're entitled to everything. Su Hyun breathed deeply and handed the envelope to Su Ho, ordering him to send these documents to Ryu Hai's operators in Korea. Su Young informed them that those operators will not go to meet them in person. Su Hyun also strictly reminded them all not to leave any traces of their crimes. Su Jun at the same time trusted all those Yakuza since she believed they were pros and not from this country either. Well we can't be sure. 
And we're not trying to relive those hellish two years again, Su Hyun added. Chang Tzu was shaking as he saw Su Hyun approaching him. Since Su Hyun received a message from Jun Hyuk saying that he was going to play with the toy first, he asked Chang Tzu about what Jun Hyun meant to say instead of telling the truth, Chang Tzu answered that he was not sure about it. You sure about that? Su Hyun asked while staring eye to eye at Chang Tzu. Of course. Why would I lie to you? Chang Su answered, and because of his response, Su Hyun was forced to believe him. Su Ho received a message from those Yakuza saying that they will get Su Young and bring him here to their spot after one hour. That fast? Su Young asked and Su Hyun was expressionless and will be looking forward to it. Those Yakuza are already below the building of Su Young's villa. They were talking using Japanese words and one bald man declared that their current mission is commencing now. They immediately went to the rooftop and the bald man reminded his colleague that their target is an 18 years old kid, but upon seeing the bloody surroundings, he concludes that they shouldn't take this mission too lightly. Shall we begin? He uttered while holding his wrist. His colleague tapped his shoulder, which made him confused. He turned his head to ask what was the matter. The bolder man named Kenta was just silent while trying to smell the place. He senses a bad aura coming from the room of Young, and he believes that there's a wild beast living on this rooftop. The bald man was flustered, and he was hesitant to believe that Si Young is raising a dog. Since it was too quiet, Kenta then corrected him that it was not a dog, but a wild beast. Kenta, there's no way a wild beast lives in the middle of a city. Are you saying he's hot? A wolf in there or something? The bald man asked and Kenta answered perhaps. But still, the bald man continuously walked towards the room of Si Young. While Kenta is following behind, we dutifully carry out our mission, the bald man confidently said and ready himself to kick Young's room. But then, before he can do something, Si Young strongly punched his door, causing it to be damaged. The bald man was stuck while Kenta grits his teeth out of annoyance, his sweat dropped from his forehead and he was behind Si Young. While Si Young is just standing still, Si Young turned around and saw Kenta already clenched his fist and dashed to Si Young. While screaming, he punched Young's head and he was dumbfounded. Seeing Young remained fine. His fist was trembling and at this moment, Si Young raised his arm and was clenching his fist and strongly punched Kenta. Because of the strong force he deal, Kenta was slammed on the floor, causing the ground to be crumpled. He was pushing his first to Kenta's face, and when he removed his hand, Kenta's nose is bleeding and his teeth got damaged. His whole face was literally beaten by Si Young was standing still, and he side-eyed to see the bald man. Seeing Kenta unconscious makes the bald man shocked. He was also bleeding, and he was already shaking in fear. Roman Eleven Young lowers his head, and the bald man was terrified of him and cannot move even an inch. At the same time, Su Hyun together with his Su Young, Chang Tzu and Su Ho were still at their spot. Why didn't you accompany the others? Su Hyun asked as he was facing the colleague of Kenta. This man was confident that those two can easily bring Si Young to them. His name is Takashi. Japan Three Paths Association Loan Sharking Division they're pro among pros. No need to worry at all he said. But Su Hyun still doubts a little. Takashi received a call and upon checking it was from Kenta. He answered the call and spoke using the Japanese language. I told you not to call without a reason he said. Without knowing that Si Young is the one who was calling him using Kenta's phone. Because of his language, Si Young found out that these people were Japanese. Takashi was confused upon hearing Young's voice and he asked who it is. But he only heard Kenta screaming in pain and asking for help. He was dumbfounded as he cannot believe that the Kenta he knows is a strong man and undefeatable is now screaming in pain. He grits his teeth and was already annoyed. Where are you? Si Young asked and since Takashi didn't give an answer, Si Young used his foot and pushed it to Kenta's chest. Kenta was continuously screaming in agony, but Takashi hung up the call. At this time, he was already mad, knowing that Kenta and the bald man have failed their mission. Si Young then let the bald man drive the car and ordered him to go to Si Hyun's hideout. 
The bald man told him that it was just 10 minutes from this building, but then Si Young only gave him 5 minutes to arrive in the said place. The bald man was still shaking in fear and cannot do anything but follow Young's order. Si Young was so tall than the vehicle, and since he knows that it was hard for him to enter, he decided to remove the roof of the vehicle and throw it away. Kenta was also here with them, and he was lying inside the passenger seat. After removing the roof, Si Young then stomped on the vehicle and inserted his half-body, while instructing the bald man to go. Takashi was unaware that Si Young is already on his way to them, but he already has a hint that Si Young will really come. After he hung up the call, Su Hyun asked what happened. Takashi still grits his teeth while ordering them all to leave this place as soon as possible. Su Hyun and the others were confused, so Takashi honestly said that they have failed in the mission. For your own safety, please return to your home, he added. Failed? Is that even possible? To fail to grab a shitty little kid like that? Su Hyun responded. Takashi was already rattled and said that he will just explain everything once they can move in a secure place. Su Hyun, Sayang, Chang Su, and Suho were still puzzled while looking at Takashi. But Takashi still didn't give an explanation. He was already frowning and repeating his warning and told them that this is for their own safety. Sion was annoyed, especially Su Hyun. He was confused about what was dangerous in this place, which made Takashi force them to leave because of it. He concludes that there might be someone coming to them. I mean I'm laughing at the fact that you said you actually failed at bringing one shitty little kid here. And what? You're talking about our safety? You think I want to talk about safety? Suhan screamed in anger. All of a sudden, they heard someone screaming so loud, which made them all startled. Takashi was stuttering while saying that Si Young is now here. Si Young really arrived at their place and he was standing fearlessly outside the building while carrying the sword at his back. They start to panic and see that there are three stairs leading to the exit. They decide to split up with the Japanese man and one other person going one way and the rest going another way. The Japanese man thinks they should all go together, but suggestion is ignored. Without wasting time, they all run away, hoping that one of them will run into the boy. As it turns out, this is exactly what happened. Because it is the boy himself who ends up rescuing the prize, while the others manage to reach the exit along with the police. Chang Su is fainted, so when he wakes up, he notices that his legs and hands are tied. He quickly looks around, but he doesn't recognize anyone. The protagonist reminds him of what happened to Chang Su's, which shocks him. He realizes that the scrawny boy has become a beast. Meanwhile, the news media has already arrived at the scene calling the kidnapping. The special police group is also asking the protagonist his name and why he is doing all of this. Our boy takes his time before slowly pulling out his sword and pointing it at the man, while loudly recounting how three years ago, two people in flames sacrificed themselves seeking justice. And those people were none other than his own parents. Upon hearing this account of the tragedy, everyone present immediately recognizes it, and fear begins to invade their positions. As it was very obvious what was to come, it is worth noting that up until this point, all the inhabitants of the country, even the parents of the harassers, were watching this live. The mediator of the police asked him desperately what his demand was, to which he coldly replied that there would be no negotiation, that all he had was a simple announcement. He said, my parents paid with their lives in the fire to attract the attention of people for justice. But from today, everyone who is responsible for this has to pay with their lives, and swore that he would kill them with his own hands as well as their parents, brothers and sisters. But his speech did not end there. He continued to say that no one would be able to stop his revenge, and that if the police or the army tried to get in his way, he would have no problem finishing all of them off there. Without any hesitation Chang Su with full of tears tried to convince him to let him go. But the protagonist just looked at him and made him stop saying. The protagonist continued to conclude his speech, yelling at everyone to pay attention and raising his sword, declaring that this was his declaration of war. Then he quickly made a fierce movement and ended the blonde.
Meanwhile, Chang Tzu's father, who observed the whole situation, is left completely paralyzed. Similarly, the president starts to take measures by calling the police commissioner and explicitly ordering him to immediately execute the protagonist. This order is instantly received by the police, so the snipers are prepared to shoot, and they begin the attack by aiming at his head indiscriminately. However, he doesn't make it easy for them and bravely deflects the bullets with his sword. In response to this, the police force begins to open fire on Sewang, but he quickly dodges the bullets and jumps from the building, using his sword to fall without a scratch. He then stands in front of the police cars and clearly screams that anyone who gets in his way will end up dead. In a brutal move, he throws his sword and starts destroying a couple of vehicles that are only in the way. He advances slowly through the gunfire, leaving the police to wonder if he is even human, despite seeing what he is capable of. They continue to shoot at him, but they can't hit him at all. After seeing that nothing is working, the police desperately ask the sniper to shoot the protagonist, but at last, he cut the sniper bullet into parts using his sword. Fiend realizes that the police won't stop, so he charges at them, crushing a couple and sweeping the rest to the ground. At this point, the journalists run away in terror, leaving behind even their own cameras, which managed to capture some of the disturbance caused by our young protagonist. All of this was observed on television by those who bullied the protagonist, and after seeing this, they were shivering from fear and didn't know what was coming next. Sei Wang manages to break through the police and forces one of them to tell him the exact location where the kids had escaped. The chief, upon learning of this, calls all units and informs them that the protagonist is headed towards the university hospital. But it seems it was too late. As we see the protagonist standing in front of the building observing his prey, the pair of bullies receive support from the Secret Service, so they try to evacuate them to a safe place. However, they receive an alert that the protagonist is on his way. Without giving them time to react, he breaks a window and makes contact with them. From there, he emerges from the rubble and starts to advance, yelling at Su Haiyan, telling them why they are running now, even in the face of their parents' power and influence. My parents stood firm for my sake and did not choose to run like you. The men in charge of protecting the bullies try to hold him back, but they are thrown out of the building. This short time is used by the bullies to try and escape at full speed. In the elevator, the situation is that when the door was about to close, one of the men arrives and asks to be let in. We see that the door manages to close, but they start to descend instead of going up as they wanted. And all this is because the protagonist was standing on top of it, preparing to attack them. He begins randomly slashing with his sword without looking, trying to hit anyone who gets in his way. The elevator is forced to the first floor and the door is open. Everyone tries to leave as quickly as possible. However, the guard who held Su Young one of the bully girl is not able to run with such luck as he receives a sword slash in the whole shoulder that destabilizes him. It is at that precise moment that Su Jun regains consciousness, and upon seeing this scene, she throws herself out of his arms, managing to escape. The protagonist was not going to stop at anything, so he brutally crushes the guard in order to continue with his revenge. Here, an angry Se Young starts to come out from the smoke and tells them where they think they're going. The pair of bullies are completely cornered and without any escape route. They think that this is the end for them, when suddenly, a vehicle arrives at full speed, impacting Seung and sending him flying. It was a special bodyguard sent directly by Young's father. The bullies escape while the bodyguard stays to face the protagonist, and everything indicated that he could do something to stop the boy, but he ended up disappointing as Seon easily gets rid of him with just one punch to the face. In this way, the bullies and their men were able to escape at full speed to a safe place. Here, several reinforcements were added to ensure their escape would be successful. However, as expected, our protagonist appeared in the air, attacking the vehicles. He jumped from one car to another, reaching the car of his prey, and with a sword strike, sent the roof of the car flying. 
Sujin screamed for his life with tears, but this did not stop the protagonist, who without losing time, proceeded to kill them. However, the driver managed to avoid this by breaking abruptly, causing Xiang to be thrown out again. Here, the police force comes again to try to stop him. They use all possible weapons, but as expected, they don't even tickle the protagonist. He proceeds to rise towards some bridge poles, and from there, he launches himself to finish off the obstacle and make his way towards his goal. Meanwhile, the pair of harassers are already mounted on a helicopter, ready to escape. Our protagonist becomes furious and prepares to launch his sword to prevent their escape. But right there, he stops and tells himself that this is not the way in which they should die. Instead, he will wait for them to be consumed by despair. On the other hand, we see government officials gathered to debating the ways to stop sale. Strangely, the president is not in attendance at this important meeting because he is simultaneously attending another private meeting where the parents of the harassers are also discussing how to solve this problem. They come to the conclusion to send all of the arsenal of assassins. In this way, we return to our protagonist who heads without much haste towards the cemetery of his parents. Here, upon entering, the doorman manages to identify him and immediately calls the police to come and arrest him. But Seung doesn't care. He heads to the tomb of his parents and begins to talk with them. He starts by asking for forgiveness for not visiting them as soon as he could step out of his house. There, the pain invades him, and he starts to cry inconsolably. Telling them how much he misses them, he says, Mom and Dad, please don't worry. I fully understand what I am doing, so relax and watch me from there. That he will not forgive a single one of them, and not one of them will live. Not even the country that turned its back on them when they only wanted justice. He says, the pain I feel after losing you, their parents will get back, is pain of losing their own children. Having said that, he proceeds to leave some of his belongings for them, expressing that it's all that is left of that son that they loved so much. Just then, the police arrive at the location and begin to ask him to surrender as he is completely surrounded. But at the same time, the military arrives without warning and starts bombing him with a tank. This, while it doesn't hit him directly, is enough to cause a tremendous explosion. When they believe they had gone too far, he comes out from the smoke, grabs his large sword, and puts it between his teeth to take a fighting stance. We see that this position he takes is called the wolf form, where he charges at high speed and starts to shred anyone in his way. As expected, he finishes off the military without much trouble. After this massacre, Sayun looks towards the horizon and remembers his parents when they were together with him. This saddens him for a moment, but at the same time fills him with conviction. To continue with his vengeance, he proceeds to leave the place and goes in search of his next victim. The government begins investigating Sei Wang's background information, but they are unable to find anything relevant, except that his only remaining close relative is an aunt. Contacting her will be difficult as she has moved to the United States and formed a family there. However, this is not an obstacle as they contact the Korean embassy in the United States to visit the aunt's house and convince her to return, whether voluntarily or by force if necessary. In the scene, we see two agents arriving at the aunt's home and presenting themselves as part of the Korean embassy. However, the woman, seeing the violent way in which they presented themselves, refuses to let them in, but the agents tell her that it is about her nephew Seong, and it is only then that the woman decides to open the door. It is here that she realizes that it was not just two agents, but a literal squad was ready and prepared to attack. This scene is left there as we see it again. Now, let's move on to the protagonist's end. Apart from the group of harassers, this time it was who was with Suho. Here, they receive a call from Gi and another member of harassers group, who asks how they are on this. He gets angry at the call, telling him to worry only about himself and not to bother him anymore. Without any reason and with a trembling voice, he insists on asking if they are in a safe and out of danger place, to which his friend tells him that yes they are, because his father sent him to a United States military base installed in Korea. He also adds that no one can enter there, 
so it is impossible for the Saiyan to find them in this way. He hangs up the call with saying that he should stop worrying since it is very obvious that the nervousness is consuming him. However, the reason he is so nervous or afraid is because next to him, Protagonist is standing, and after cutting the call, he starts to beg the Protagonist to forgive him because he already did what he wanted, which was to call his friend and find the place where he was hiding. Here, in a more general way, we can appreciate how our Protagonist and did all the security to find this bully. Desperately, the bully tries to convince the protagonist that all the harassment was on orders and that he was not to blame, that he was only following orders. Here he kneels and full of tears starts to beg him to please forgive him and adding that he was wrong and that now he is fully remorseful for everything he did. Our protagonist stops to look at him directly and asks him, when we were begging for our life, what did you guys do? And at this question, he stays paralyzed without words, to which our protagonist, shouting, asks him again. And with no answer, our protagonist raises his sword in front of his eyes and proceeds to let it fall with a simple but effective goodbye. This is how the protagonist ends his second victim. Now, with the obtained information, he heads for the next one. Without any drama, he goes to the city center to take transportation that takes him to the military base where other bullies are hiding. Obviously, on the road, other people already recognize him, and as soon as they see him, they start running away quickly. At the bus stop, the protagonist raises his hand to be able to get on a bus, but the driver, upon seeing him, also manages to identify him. So he pretends not to see him and tries to pass him without stopping the bus. But the protagonist was not going to allow this and pulls the vehicle, forcing it to stop. On the other hand, we see the president having a private conversation with Sahin's father, who tells him that he sent his son to the United States military base located in Korea, where security is guaranteed. So he encourages him to send his daughter there too. The president finds this a very good idea, so he immediately gives the order to take his daughter there. After this, we see Sujin with her personal agent, arriving at the army base as soon as they arrive. The alarm starts sounding, but people tell her not to worry, that everything is under control. However, nothing was fine because at that precise moment, our protagonist had just arrived and using only his body, he knocked down the whole wall to be able to enter the base. There, he advances a few steps at a slow pace and stops to shout out Sahan's name at the top of his voice. The American soldiers arrive at full speed, standing in his way, and ask him to drop his sword and raise his hand. On which the protagonist replied, There are people I seek hiding in this place. He knows that the troops will not stop without fighting, so he decides to throw his sword. But instead of using it as a form of surrender, he uses it to be ejected from the smoke and mouth on it. This way he splits an armored tank in two in a magnificent way. Thus, Sang begins a new massacre, destroying vehicles and shooting against soldiers, killing and destroying several of them. Seung takes the time to gain momentum and make a jump, reaching a great height and then falling with everything on the last armored tank, where he pierces the driver with a. This tremendous pose leaves the surviving soldiers paralyzed. But just then, the operational base of the CIA is shown as they were observing everything through the squad's cameras. These people are surprised by the protagonist's potential and suggest that even the combat android they have in process does not even reach his heels, as well as all the projects they were secretly developing. One of the members of this group tells the others that he will leave in an hour to Korea, stating that the best thing is to stop attacking. Sang as a valuable being like this should not be damaged. This order immediately reaches the squad in Korea, and the military proceeds to ceasefire. The protagonist, who is devastating each one of them surprisingly realizes that they stopped attacking, and even more surprisingly, they move aside, leaving him a clear path to continue advancing. The boy becomes suspicious, believing it to be a trap, but this doesn't matter to him, so he continues on his march. On the other hand, the newly elected president of Korea had just found out that the protagonist had managed to break into a military base, 
He calls the people in charge of his daughter, but during the call, the signal is lost not only to her, but to the entire sector's security. This begins to worry her as she believes something is wrong, so she decides to take a few minutes to see how to proceed. Meanwhile, this is happening. The president's daughter, Sujun is meeting with another bully, Sahian. Without knowing what is happening outside the building, she said she spoke with Yujin on the phone before coming there, and Yujin told her that she had a foolproof plan to stop the monster Sam, but she did not mention what it was. Suddenly, Sian asks his companion to bring water from the car, and the companion obliges and leaves. Sujin's personal agent takes advantage of this opportunity to approach the president's daughter and whisper to her that they sense something is wrong, so she also returns to the room, leaving Sahian alone. In this way, they manage to move a few meters away from the room when they hear a loud scream. The security of Sahian opens the door of the room and realizes that the protagonist has just arrived, but he is not alone. In one of his hands, he holds the completely destroyed body of his companion. The protagonist looks at Seon and drops the body of his companion in front of him, leaving him completely stunned. He desperately tries to escape while security with grenades. But as we know, this will not even tickle him. On the other hand, in a brief scene, we see the Sion father going at full speed to the military base because he lost contact with his son and someone mysteriously blocked the signal of the entire base, so he was unaware of the current situation at the military base. Having said that, we return to Sion. He barely managed, manages to escape and goes looking for Sujung in her room, only to find that he has been abandoned right there in the hallway. The protagonist thirsty for blood, arrives and corners him. He looks him in the face and asks, do you understand why I have to do all this right in this way? By asking him this, a memory from three years ago is shown where we observe the protagonist in school where by chance he runs into Sahian the bully. He immediately apologizes, but the bully doesn't respond and looks at him with a look full of hatred. This insignificant reason was enough for the bully not to wait for the exit and to start beating him. He hits him repeatedly, causing our protagonist to start bleeding and telling him, we barely started man, so don't go passing out. Then the bully grabs him by the hair and asks him, why did you have to get in my way and piss me off? Do you know who I am? How dare you block my way? The protagonist cannot believe that for something as minor as a simple push is the cause of this beating. But the bully doesn't care, so he continues to hit him hard. However, a companion of the protagonist arrives and screams at the bully to stop. The scene ends there, and we are shown the present where the protagonist is confronted by Sahian. The bully starts to insult the protagonist by challenging him to kill him. But there is a reason for this sudden bravery. The bully has a card up his sleeve. He tells the protagonist that he can't kill him because if he does, the same thing will happen to his beloved aunt. Hearing this, the protagonist stops and looks at him without much to do. Then the S army contacts the protagonist to inform him that his aunt is indeed in a dangerous situation. This makes Sehan even more brave, and he starts to insult and provoke the protagonist by asking him to kill him if he doesn't care about his aunt. However, the military man hasn't finished talking so he continues with his message, telling the protagonist that as his aunt is a citizen of the United States, the government has taken measures to safeguard her safety. Or rather, they managed to evacuate her in time, and now she is in a safe place under protection. This news confuses the bully and his joy slowly turns into deep despair. After hearing this, there is nothing to stop the protagonist now, and he starts his revenge and beats the bully hard, making him tremble with pain on the ground. But that's nothing compared to what's coming next. As the protagonist sees him writhing on the ground, he looks at one of his legs, and in a bloody way he cuts it off with the tip of his sword. Here, the bully starts to scream in pain, while the protagonist starts to smile at him in a demonic way. Our protagonist tells that at first his intention was to end it easily and quickly. But then he remembered that he is not the type of person capable of learning from his mistakes, and all that blackmailing with his aunt confirms it. Therefore, he took the trouble to prepare a special ending just for him. 
He starts to lift his sword and points it at his face where we see the sword starts to be on fire. So he proceeds to light up his victim alive and look peacefully as Sehien slowly consumed by flames. While telling himself that maybe this way he can feel something of the agony that his parents suffered. This whole situation is left in suspense. On other side, we are shown the father of Sahian who just arrived at the military base. This man tries to enter the base at all costs, but the special forces do not allow him to. According to orders from his superiors, they cannot let anyone enter. So the father of Sahian calls the president directly. But the president decides not to answer because he had just received a call from the people in charge of his daughter, informing him that she had managed to escape from the military base with the help of a helicopter. However, the other boys were not so lucky, and they used him as bait to escape. Having said that, we return to the leader of the special forces team who is still guarding the place. One of his men arrives at full speed to inform him that they have found two officers beheaded. And according to witnesses, it is believed that the accused was none other than the protagonist himself. This confuses the leader as they are supposed to be guarding the perimeter where the protagonist is. So it is impossible that he has left the base without being seen by anyone to commit this crime. In this way, they go to the office to investigate this situation. Then, unexpectedly, a man arrives claiming he has information regarding the murder of those two officers last night. In this way, this confusing incident is left in suspense as we are shown the military base again where the military squad was just entering the rooms where all the commotion took place. There they come face to face with a corridor full of dead bodies belonging to security. But despite this it was nothing compared to what they would see as they continued to advance, because a few meters further on, they found the body of a completely burnt and black person. To top it off, one of the soldiers noticed that the bully was still alive. This soldier suggested to the other that they should call the doctor to try and help him, but the other replied that no one can help someone in that state and the best thing to do is to leave him there until he dies. So they proceed to move forward to clean the sector and secure the area. Once this is done, they go to meet the protagonist who was about to leave the place. Here, the soldiers start to surround him and kindly inform him that there is someone from the United States who wants to see him. But this is of no interest to him, although he leaves the sector with a tremendous jump. However, when he was already in the air, the soldier tells him that it is the person who prevented the kidnapping of his aunt, which stops the boy immediately, and he looks at him with anger. The troops invite him to spend the night at the base because the person who wants to meet him will arrive the next day. There they take advantage of giving him some food and new clothes so that he is completely comfortable in this way. The next day, the guy arrives directly from the CIA to meet the protagonist. He presents himself with the name of Paul, telling him that he is delighted to meet him. But protagonist interrupts him by telling him to go straight to the point. Paul tells him that it is very simple. The government of the United States needs his help in something and sees it as a return of favor for not intervening in his revenge, but on the contrary because they helped him to carry it out. Additionally, he adds that together with the American government they were able to protect his aunt and now she is completely safe. The protagonist is looking at Paul with suspicion and tells him that he will only grant him one favor. Paul responds that this has to be negotiated and tries to blackmail him with the safety of his aunt. This angers the protagonist who threatens him, saying that if anything were to happen to his aunt, not only will Paul be responsible, but the whole of the United States will have to pay the consequences. He then asks Paul to inscribe this on his heart. These words leave Paul completely intimidated so he has no choice but to take the protagonist to the exit where he guides him towards a tunnel where he can leave without anyone bothering him. But before he leaves, Paul mentions that he has valuable information that can be of great help. He mentions that of his four remaining objectives, the closest one to this position is Yong, while Jun Hayuk and Yu Jian are still at their residence and strangely they seem rather relaxed about the whole thing. He also takes the opportunity to ask if the protagonist knows a girl named Kshin. 
Hearing this name, the protagonist is paralyzed and does not say a word while Paul continues talking and mentioning that Junha K and Eugen always mention this girl while they talk on the phone. This information drastically changes the attitude of our boy, who turns around and looks at him with a terrifying look. In this way, the conversation ends abruptly as the protagonist leaves at full speed, leaving it clear that all this news about the girl named Shen affected him greatly. This is how we are shown the leader of the special forces, who is interrogating a man who claims to have information about the murder of two officers. The night before, the man begins to confess that three years ago, in the incident of school bullying that the protagonist was involved in, he was not the only victim, as a companion of his also suffered serious injuries. It is revealed that the identity of this girl is precisely Xin, and that unlike the protagonist, her case was kept completely secret until now. The man confesses that all the doctors and police officers who assisted this girl were paid to keep quiet as well as the parents decided to. From these powerful families, he adds that all the witnesses at the scene and everyone who witnessed Xin's state were compensated on the condition that they keep quiet. The interrogator asks him why he is telling him this now, and the man responds that he fears for his life as he also accepted being bribed. The interrogator interrupts him and asks where Xin is now, to which the man responds that he doesn't know, but probably she is dead. The head of the special forces immediately orders one of his men to investigate where Xin is located. In minutes, the girl's report arrives, indicating that she is still alive, but is confined in a psychiatric hospital. There we begin to see the girl in her room drawing on the wall, and curiously, they depict the deaths of two policemen at her hands. The situation remains as we return to our protagonist heading towards his next victim. This time, he is heading to the sector where Junhak and Eugen live. Eugen is the first one to find out about it as she sees a live broadcast of him advancing towards their zone through social media. Immediately, she sends a message to her friend alerting him of everything that's happening. After hearing this, Junhat goes to his mother and informs her as well as the police and military who are protecting him. Right then they receive confirmation by radio that the protagonist has decided to advance first to Eugen's house, not this guy's. This is how Jun Hick finds out and quickly calls his friend to tell her. But on the other end of the call, he only hears a loud and ominous scream. The bully starts to feel extreme fear and tells them that they must leave immediately as he knows a way to stop the protagonist. Jun Hick's mom tries to stop him by saying that they even have military protection here. But Jun Hick replies that they can't stop Sang. If he gets there, they will all be dead. So they leave before Sang reaches there. With that, we see Sang already inside Yujin's house, firmly grasping her neck and asking her where Ziyun is. She responds that she is at the psychiatric hospital and begs for forgiveness as she is telling the truth. Furious, he tells her that after waking up from a coma, he tried everything to contact Shihyun, but nobody knew of her because she was not registered in the news, social media, or even in school records. He even thought she never existed and began to doubt himself that she had ever existed. He continues by saying that the reason he is doing this is because of their attitude. They acted as if nothing had happened while his parents were dying. In complete depths of despair and that they had the pleasure of burying the existence of a normal and innocent girl without any remorse. He then furiously raises his fist and strikes her in the stomach. Splitting her in two and damaging the wall. Lastly, he throws away the top half just to watch her last seconds of life. The story then immediately goes to the psychiatric hospital where Jun Hick and his mother have arrived and start running in a hurry towards the second floor of the hospital. Upon seeing this, the doctor of the hospital tries to ask them who they are, but in response, Jun Hayek throws him. After seeing this behavior, the doctor smiles in a demonic way as if he knows something bad. Later, we see Shihan, the protagonist's companion, on a hospital bed. It was always the bully's plan to go after Shihan and use her to blackmail the protagonist. Jun Huck smiles upon finding her, but they are warned that the protagonist has also arrived. Sean quickly destroys the roof to reach her floor where he is met by many soldiers, but the protagonist easily dispatches them. 
He goes to her door but becomes scared when he sees blood on the window. Thinking he's too late, he opens the door and is surprised to see a happy and ecstatic Shihyun who is covered in blood belonging to the bully. This is because she had taken care of getting rid of the bully herself. Furthermore, the bully's mother, upon seeing this, begins to berate him, telling him who he thinks he is and what right he has to decide if her son lives or dies. But at that moment, everything stops as Shiyun also finishes off the bully's mother. Lastly, she turns towards Sang, looks him in the face, and proceeds to give him a cheerful smile. At this point, we begin to see how she met the protagonist, where she was transferred to Sang's school from another school. She was the first ranked student there. She selflessly began to help Sang pick up trash even though he had never spoken to her before. But when he did, he told her she shouldn't help him because if the others found out, they would start to harass her just like they did him. She replied that he shouldn't worry, that she would pretend to bully him so that no one notices that she is helping him. That's when they became friends. As in another memory, she tells him that today someone confessed to her, and he responds that it shouldn't surprise him because she is intelligent, beautiful and very popular. She tells him that she had to reject him because she found him strange and unpleasant, and asks him if he is not serious about who it was. Here, she tells him that it was Suho, and it was very funny that at the moment of the confession, he was accompanied by his entire group. Later on, we see them sitting outside the school talking. The protagonist asks if after class, she will go somewhere. To which she sadly replies that yes, because someone from the bully group will do her the favor of introducing her to some new friends from another class. She confesses to him that she accepted this because from the moment she rejected Suho, her friends gradually stopped talking to her. Upon hearing this, he tells her that she shouldn't go because it's a trap that they will force her to do unpleasant things like stealing from someone or swallowing glue, all in the name of humiliating her. And he knows this very well because they did the same thing to him a while back. Additionally, he tells her that from the moment she rejected Suho, and they saw her hanging out with him, she became a target for that group. Here, another memory begins to take shape. This time, from the moment they were beating the protagonist because he warned Shiyun and asked him how he could steal their toy and interrupt their fun. It was at that moment that she arrived screaming for them to stop. But unfortunately, she met the same fate as the bullies beat both of them while mocking them saying that they have heard that you have been spending a lot of time with Shihyun. Are you two dating or just playing house with each other? In addition, they said that they had planned to forcefully give his girlfriend a part-time kissing job and would also pay a good amount of money for it. But he kept running their plans. Each time, our boy cried out for them to stop hurting Ziyun and said he would do anything they asked. However, one of the bullies disagreed and ordered the others to strip his clothes and underwear too. But then they noticed that Ziyun had stood up, and in the face of this humiliating scene, Shihun decided to jump off the building with tears. All these memories come to both of their heads at this point. So we return to the present where San is reunited with Shihan in an emotional scene. The protagonist can't hold back his tears and stands up to touch her face. She returns the gesture, telling him that he's changed a lot, and that she has many things to tell him. However, this emotional scene can't last long because they have to leave immediately. They leave the room, but are stopped by new reinforcements that have just arrived. But surprisingly, these are taken down by the same doctors and nurses from the hospital. These people are somehow interested in Sheehan, so they protect her and guide her to escape. Safely. So in an armored vehicle. They leave without raising any suspicion there. More calmly, they start talking, and he tells her that he thought she was dead. She breaks down in tears, telling him that she's sorry for not telling him and making things harder for him. At this, our boy also breaks down and embraces her, saying, Thank you for being alive. Subscribe to our Manhua Ghost YouTube channel and be a part of our amazing YouTube community.